Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we will finally discover where the best planet in our solar system is hiding. What better planet than one that's made of money? And to help us decipher the exact location, we welcome today one guy who was behind the wildly successful podcast, NPR's Planet Money, Adam Davidson. Plus, all of the volatility in the stock market has led to some interesting investment trends. Is investing in bankruptcies a viable way to outperform the market? We'll talk about Hertz and other bad ideas on today's show. Plus, if discovering a new planet isn't enough for you, don't worry, there's more. We'll also toss out the Haven Lifeline to Dave, who has a question about converting his traditional IRA to Roth. And of course, we'll save time for my out-of-this-world trivia. And now, two guys who are just a couple of space cadets. Yeah, that's right, I said it. Joe and O J J J J G. Absolutely, I'm a space kid. Are you kidding me? With all the SpaceX stuff going on, all the excitement around um, sky rockets uh, in flight. Oh no, I don't want. I don't want to get on. Afternoon delight. Oh boy, that's a. That's Does that a, mean something different? Th- that song might not mean what you think it means. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Stacking Benjamins. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table from me virtually today, because let's pull let's pull back the uh, curtain, even though talk about bass backwards. (laughs) Doug is live in the basement. I am live at your house. Yes, you are live from an undisclosed location. Well, it's not undisclosed. We're in Michigan. Well, now it's disclosed. There we go. Should now said, it's un, undisclosed. Hashtag spoiler. I just didn't want all the big fans coming in mobbing your... Uh, it's happened. OG compound. Compound, yeah. <laughs> That's what this is. I should start calling it that. You know, they talk about how you, when you use different words, different language, it like, you know, has different things in your brain. So if you stop calling it a hole, maybe, maybe it'll be a little bit more exciting to go to. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful place. I'm going to go to the compound this weekend. What are you guys up to? See, that's got a little <laughs> ring to it, doesn't it? That, it, does, it totally does. Hey, we got a great show today. We got Adam Davidson on, one of the creators of Planet Money, OG. Ooh. One of uh, Fighting above our weight class all of a sudden. It's, huh? it's incredible. And the second that people hear that voice, they will know that we are definitely talking to Adam Davidson. But first, we've got some great headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our first piece today comes to us from financial planning. Normally, OG, we don't talk about opinion pieces, but with all the things going on in the world right now, I think this is uh, an important piece written by Desarde Yarnway. Uh, How crisis is accelerating change in wealth management. Desarte writes, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was a young investment advisor at a large firm. I'd landed there after a long stretch applying for jobs in management consulting, technology, sales, and everywhere in finance. The soft echoes of the consistent no's that I had heard in response to 265 applications still were close enough in my frontal cortex that I felt the pressure to prove myself day in and day out. My experience at the firm was in line with what was expected from the financial services industry. It was male-dominated at all levels. Marginally diverse and executives believe that their asset management strategy was the value add for all their client relationships. After a while, my curiosity bubbled over and I went searching for answers for a culture of inclusivity and mentorship, one that would allow talent to shine no matter the age, race, or background. I searched far and wide. I went from San Francisco, where I worked for a large asset management firm, to Arizona as an advisor to broker dealer, and finally found myself on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan as a vice president wealth manager at one of the world's largest banks. I found that not many firms were truly pushing the limits of innovation. Instead, their agendas only aligned with their commitment to meeting their quarterly earnings, guidance, and capturing market share as they prospected for talent who could think narrowly enough 
to move the needle just a bit further. This was business as usual. Simultaneously, the opportunity for value and innovation was being presented to me at every step along the journey. I could see a firm's value wasn't simply in the strategy it gave clients in exchange for a percentage-based fee. Value and innovation could be seen, first at all, in a firm's core mission. A firm could be educative, community-oriented, adaptive, and committed to making sure that its trusting clients were at the forefront of their plans. Innovation is the ability to identify a problem, take action, and nourish the idea from seed to tree, often before anyone else has seen the issue. This requires a firm to take seriously the concept and responsibility of servant leadership, which inevitably leads to a robust business and more importantly, indispensable impact. That's a lead in, by the way, to this year's uh, financialplanning.com's visionary leader award. And he's, he's presenting this year's innovative leader, which by the way, outside the scope of this discussion, we'll link to it in our show notes. But what I like here, OG, about this piece is that we're not talking in this piece about financial planning being more diverse for diversity's sake. I think what he's saying is that if a firm's truly going to be innovative, is truly going to serve more people better, it isn't just in the ideas. It's about bringing more people that come from various backgrounds, not some baloney checkbox diversity thing that a, that a company will do, but actually more profits mean more innovation. More innovation also means bringing some people to the table who look and sound and feel much more like the client base that they're serving. I'm thumbing through Ray Dalio's book, that principles book. Have you seen that? Never heard of Um, it. No, I'm kidding. Probably one of the, you know, that's going to probably go down as one of the biggest books of this decade. Last decade. Is this still this decade? (laughs) I'm not sure. Are we at the the Y2K argument over again? Remember that? Are we going to do that? Yeah. Yeah. The zero is still the 1900s. One of the things he talks about quite a bit is his struggle with how to set up the business, how to set up the company, because he knew that the idea of a democracy wouldn't work where everybody gets a vote. He's like, that's that's dumb. Not everybody should be entitled to the same amount of voting. You know, not everybody's got the same expertise. So why should you get to vote on an idea that you don't have any expertise in? And then he also said it's really stupid to have it be you know, like a dictatorship where he's just the one in charge. And he struggled with it for a really long time, so, you know, two decades as he kind of massaged it and kept on making adjustments to it to reflect that different people have different strengths. I don't think that he comes right out and says we need to have a diversity of people to have diversity of thought to have, you know, sustainable growth in the business. But that's kind of the message there is that if everybody is cut from the same cloth, And, you know, like he says in this piece here where he's talking about all that he was trying to do or all that his bosses were trying to do at the big bank was make sure they hit their quarterly numbers and their quarterly numbers are, you know, disclosed well in advance. And that's the only goal. Then there's no benefit for outside the box thinking. There's no benefit for a diverse set of opinions. But then you look at companies like like Bridgewater uh, that Dalio has and they are some of the biggest organizations and the most well-run organizations in the world because they just recognize that people have different strengths and so be it. Let's, they can look let's at things from, ideas. from different points of view. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I became a financial planner, I was told that over time I would find people that were like me and I would, those people I'd be a magnet toward and other people I would be the opposite end of that magnet. I would repel people who weren't like me. And I just imagine the financial services industry, if we had a wider range of people who were serving people, how much easier it would be for clients to find that fit, right? I mean, when it, when it seems like, I remember going in the room, I don't know how much it's changed, but 10 years ago, being in these big meetings, man, it, was, it was overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male. And it doesn't mean that white males can't get the job done for their clients. I think that the author of this piece does a good job about talking about making sure that the asset management makes sense, but it's difficult for people to get the message when the messenger looks and sounds maybe a lot different than the person trying to receive the message. Yeah. I think from a financial planning standpoint, I think what you're saying is we would be able to serve more people if we had more people on our teams that were different than us because they would attract different people. Yes. You know, I mean, I, I attract a certain type of potential client based on 
where I am in my stage of life and the things that, that are interesting to me and the things that we talk about on the show. But Jen, one of my planners, she would attract a different type of person. She's in a different stage of her life and has different priorities going on right now. Were you in the industry when the women's seminars first came out? I remember I was speaking for on behalf of American Express then. I remember seeing some of these first ones and they were so condescending, dude. They were so just like mansplaining money to women. <laughs> I remember a bunch of us just laughing at these seminars going, yeah, I can't present this. I can't, there's, there's no way I'm going to stand in front of a bunch of women and basically talk down to them about money. Thank, thank God. A lot of those presentations have changed over time. (laughs) Yeah. Painful. Good stuff here. We'll link to this in our show notes at stackybedjamins.com. But I like your point there, OG, I think to cap this off that I think this is an individual firm by firm realization, right? Hiring more people, like you talked about, Jen, who's a planner in your organization, about hiring more people with different outlooks makes the firm more robust and and does what, A, the firm wants, more money, and at the same time, widens the field for all of us, financial literacy-wise. Yep. Our, our second piece comes to us from Forbes. I love this. This is written by Dan Runkovicius. How hurts fooled amateur investors We've, we've got to walk through this, OG, because uh, Hertz has been in the news a lot lately. Hertz, first of all, said that they were going bankrupt, and then the stock went nearly to zero, and then the stock jumped and went up. I mean, Len Penzo was talking about this a couple of weeks ago on the show, went up over $6 a share, and, uh, the, and, and the stock continued to defy, defy uh, reality. And the bad news is, well, I'll read you what the bad news is from Dan. Dan writes, on June 12th, Hertz plotted what could have been one of history's greatest bankruptcy ploys. As you know, America's second largest car rental firm recently filed for bankruptcy. What was supposed to be a foregone conclusion became the head scratcher of the year. After a file, the filing, the stock roared 900% roughly from its lows in less than two weeks. It turns out the historic sale of a 102-year-old company prompted a speculation frenzy among amateur investors. Look at the exponential growth of Robinhood traders holding the stock green line. By the way, uh, you have two two different lines. You've got the price going up and down, but you also have as the price goes up, OG, and and this thing, price gets near the top. The number of Robinhood traders holding it went from under 40,000 to above 160,000 people. Then Hertz took the whole thing a notch further, setting a historic precedent on June 12th. The bankrupt company announced it would sell a billion dollars worth of new shares. Just absolutely awesome. Hertz knew this money would go straight to pay its bills. Even its legal document explicitly warned that investors would probably lose everything. And yet the company carried on with a straight face. This is sheer trolling for lack of a better word. Man, I disagree with that. If I owe somebody money... Oh, gee. And my stock goes up to six dollars and even as far as six dollars and 50 cents from zero. Right. And I all of a sudden have this value in my shares. And clearly investors don't know what's going on. If I'm Hertz, is it my job to do more than what they did? They completely disclosed that the stock is worthless and that this is just going to be money to go pay creditors. No, they don't have to do anything else. I mean, it would be one thing if they didn't do that, right? If they had just issued the stock before filing for bankruptcy, let's say, knowing that they were about to file for bankruptcy. Now you're teetering on certainly dishonest, but probably close to fraud. But after the bankruptcy filing, some idiot wants to still come and buy and sell your company to another idiot of, hey whatever. And then your little donut shop has got for sale signs in the window and some guy comes by and goes, Hey, I'll give you a hundred grand for your business. You're going to take it. Right. And then he gives the next guy comes by, he sells it to that guy for 200 grand. That guy takes it. And you find out later that some other idiot bought it for $600,000. All you're doing is you're going, well, hell, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just buy it back for a million and see if I can sell it for 2 million. <laughs> well, well, and I look at it this way. I look at what's the biggest moral dilemma that you and I both have with bankruptcy. The fact that you're not going to pay your bills. Yeah. 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 
you're not going to pay the people that you owe money to. So Hertz didn't take this and make a profit. I mean, we don't know who those bills were owed to, right? So it could have been bills to the CEO's pension fund. Right, right. It could have been that, but it still is a legal obligation. And Hertz's job is to pay off the people that it owes money to. So if, for lack of a better term, idiots go buy a bankrupt stock that's going to go back to zero. And by the way, I think initially Robinhood investors here got fooled by something. And we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I think for new people on the show, OG, it's worth mentioning again. I think they got fooled by what's called the dead cat bounce. Do you mind explaining to people what happens to a stock and why the stock goes up when it goes bankrupt? Well, I don't think that we have any real idea why stocks do what they do on a day-to-day basis. But toward the end of you know, an issuance of a stock as it's going bankrupt, there's certain people out there that have bet against it. Normally, when you buy stock, you profit when it goes up. But then you can also bet against a stock and profit when it goes down. But eventually, you have to exit that. You have to sell it. So when you put all that money back in the market, when you put all that uh, those shares back in the market, sometimes you see a little bit of a uh, an increase in the stock price as you're closing out your positions, so to speak. Back when I was a financial advisor, I would get calls, you know, 2007, 2008, as companies were going belly up, people would say, look, Joe, Lehman is coming back. I'm seeing Lehman start to notch back up again. We should, we should get into that. Maybe they're not going to. No, 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 no. Don't get fooled by that. They've already filed bankruptcy. It's already, it's already worthless. It's, it's already done. We saw this same thing earlier in the year with oil, right? People not knowing what's going on. I think it's important to maybe help people draw a lesson from this OG, that especially when you're dealing with bankruptcy, with commodities, with options, we had the trader who, it's horrible, he killed himself because of the fact that he got stuck with options. Yeah. All of those things are pure speculation. Anytime that you're betting on something to go to zero or betting on something that is already zero, it's worse than going to the casino, frankly, because at the casino, you've got slightly worse than a 50, 50 shot, generally speaking. You know I mean? Like, <laughs> like at blackjack, it's like whatever, 49.6% chance that you're going to, that you're going to win. So at least you've got kind of sort of a 50-50 chance. If, if you're buying bankrupt stocks, you have a 0% chance. You know, if you're buying if you're buying an options contract, the value of an options contract at expiration is zero. It eventually goes to zero. So uh you've got a worse than a worse than 50-50 shot. I would say that if you're itching to, you know, gamble some isn't there like some sports betting that you can do? Some well, Chinese that was going to be baseball my baseball teams or something. I was going to say that's a, that was my next question. Is this the absence of sports betting that people decided, hey, I need to bet, well, so what, now I'm going to bet on the said, yeah. bet on the stock market instead? Yeah, did you hear about what happened at the Bellagio because of the distancing? You know, they wanted to keep everybody away, so they now they have electronic betting on games. But some knucklehead set up the betting to allow you to keep on betting on the game while the game was going on. Oh my. So they lost a quarter million dollars before they figured between it like out. one and 3 AM on like Korean B league baseball teams. It's like, it's like, man, talk about needing your fix to be at the Bellagio at two 30 and being like, what game's on? Oh yeah. I'm going to bet on them. Uh, it's the Hornets against the Bobcats. Yeah, I know. I know them. Oh, the baseball team in South Korea, the double a team. Huh? I guess put me on the, Oh, it's already started. Yeah, better yet. Score? Oh, it's the ninth <laughs> inning. It's it's eleven to zero. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go home team on this one. <laughs> I don't I don't think it let it go that long, but it was slightly after the game started. And of course, it happens in the middle of the night when neither That's you nor of... when neither you nor I would be I at the. I know. It's like the infinite leverage thing on Robin Hood. How come that didn't happen when I was paying attention? <laughs> I'm paying attention now, Robin Hood. Have some glitch. <laughs> Please, Robin Hood, if you're going to be handing out cash with your glitches yeah, or Bellagio, I don't care. I'm agnostic to who has the glitch. <laughs> Just have it when I'm there. Exactly. Please. Exactly. I think that uh, that's not our first lesson, have the glitch when, I, when I'm there. I think the first, <laughs> the first lesson here is understand the fundamentals, at least of what you're doing before you get involved with some of these more complex tools, including individual stocks, options, commodities, 
leverage in general. And then our second lesson, diversity in the financial planning ranks. Heck, it's like any other business. If you can find a way to better serve customers by coming at situations more like your customer, I think you're more likely to win. Well, our next guest, I think, needs a little introduction when you hear his voice. You will know that uh, Adam Davidson was one of the creators of Planet Money. He has done several projects. He has a new one out, though, called The Passion Economy. And, oh, gee, if you're going to go into a business, I think going into a business that you're passionate about is a start. Of course, there's a lot more homework to do from there. You can't just say, oh, I like cookies. I love eating cookies, so I'm going to make a cookie company. Probably not a good you idea. Cookies, but that's what certainly... about brownies? What if you? What if brownies was your thing? You just jump into brownies, uh, ice cream, ice I, cream, and brownies. I think if you pair the two, you probably have a winning yeah. recipe. I don't know. Maybe we'll ask him about that. Maybe not. Adam Davidson, the host of the new Passion Economy podcast. And on my dad, Shortwave Radio, it's our new friend, Adam Davidson. How are you, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Well, good, but I probably do this ham radio thing completely wrong, I bet. Well, when you say shortwave, that is typically a broadcast from often a government entity, a lot of, you know, the US, uh, the UK, um, Israel, Japan, tons of countries send out broadcast signals. And they're called shortwave when when they're broadcast, but the exact same waves are also called HF, high frequency, when ham radio operators use them. So if you're getting a signal from just a regular person like me, um, then it's probably, instead of shortwave, you could say HF, high frequency. Well, I don't know, though, Adam. My dad says that this house is a government institution, and he's the government, so... Maybe, maybe, maybe. Got you. But it's about the broad, like I, so <laughs> yeah. I, all right. But also it's a, it's a misnomer because high frequency are very long, long waves, waves. very wide waves. So it, it should be called long wave. I don't know why it is called short wave. Well, I got a question for you from your book and now from the new podcast and just simply this, are robots coming for our jobs? I would say robots are coming for the jobs we have now, almost without exception, but that's not so bad because there's a lot about our jobs we have now that we don't like doing. We might not even realize how much we don't like doing. And that's going to free up time and effort and value to do lots and lots of other things. So just like your great, great, great grandparents were probably subsistence farmers somewhere, luckily for us and for them and for everyone, automated machinery took their jobs, but that's only been good news. We We don't very few people want those jobs. In fact, farming is now a job that people take because they want to do it. For most of human history, it was a job people took because if they weren't, they would die. Is the fear around robots taking our jobs then, is it the basic human fear of change uh, that I, I think many of us have, or is it deeper than that? I think that there are clearly things that are very common in human history that is going on right now, a fear of change and an inability to tell the future, which it turns out is consistent throughout human history. We don't know how to tell the future, and so we get scared. But then also there are differences now because the pace of change is unprecedented. So if you think of, I mean, going back to the very beginning of, of human beings, there have been periods of major technological advance. And you talk to paleolithic archaeologists, anthropologists, the development of needles, which allowed people to create clothing that was tighter and more robust, the development, of course, of hand tools, the develop, you know, the ability to domesticate crops and animals. These were all things that had massive implications, you know, it, it, in population, you know, entire populations died out. Other populations that were small grew big. The very nature of life was transformed Many times, even in, in prehistory, we can just tell from the archaeological record. And then through recorded history, you know, you think of almost any innovation from agriculture to more advanced plows to bronze and eventually harder steels, glass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every innovation has brought along a massive disruption in 
basically who wins and loses, who who succeeds and who fails. And that often, or almost pretty much always, has a political dimension. It has a equity dimension. It, it, it has a huge implication. So in that sense, there's nothing new. And you basically go to any time in human history and someone is complaining about the new thing and how it's going to ruin everything without realizing that new things are a double-edged sword. They they do destroy some things, but they also bring other opportunities. So that's the same as it's always been. The thing is the changes are clearly far more rapid. Like, you know, most of the innovations I talked about, these unfolded over centuries, millennia, in any one lifetime, they were almost imperceptible. And we're now obviously seeing change on a, actually my, my eight-year-old son, one of his favorite games, he loves this game, is we pretend that he goes back in time to when I was eight. And in, I was eight in 1978. And he tries to explain to me what an iPhone is. My son loves this game. And I just have no, and no ability to understand what an iPhone is. It's utterly unimaginable. But forget that change. I mean, there are changes happening this year, happening next year, et cetera, et cetera, where things that in previous human eras took either millennia or at least a generation or two to unfold are now unfolding in months or years. It, it's funny when you mentioned being eight years old then. I remember I was eight years old just a couple of years before you, but I remember even a year before that, I was seven, Mrs. Wright's second grade class and we were talking, Adam, about the future and how great the future looked. And I remember, you know what the future meant back then? It meant that we would go to the grocery store and then we would not only have this fantastic experience at the checkout where we would just, we would scan our groceries, Adam. It was so amazing <laughs> that, that our gro nobody would key in anything. And I thought that was phenomenal. And then not only that, we would have a little plastic card, like a credit card, but instead of sending it through that little roller, and not many people use credit cards then that I remember, I mean, I was seven, but not only that, you'd have another card that was attached directly to your bank account and all your money was on this plastic card. And I thought the future looked incredible. It was, it was the Jetsons back then. Yes, exactly. But then you think, I mean, just my son's eight. And when I think about the change just since he was born, forget about since you and I right. were born, it is amazing. I mean, my field of journalism has gone through multiple upheavals and, and these are real. I, I don't, I do not like to say that, you know, my vision is everything's roses, all is great, or everybody wins. Don't worry. I think there are people who fundamentally lose when there's major technological change. And certainly the upcoming future will involve, there was a whole bunch of systems that were kind of in place that made life unusually benign for most of the 20th century into the 21st century. And I think those things are are falling away. So I do think life will require more hustle. It'll require more conscious effort. And there will be probably more volatility, meaning all of us will experience periods of highs and lows. And some people will be permanently worse off. But I think on balance, the changes we're going through have the potential to be very positive for a very large number of people. So that is a point I think a lot of people don't, I think can be very good news for some people, I hope. Well, and I think that's why your new podcast, The Passion Economy, is so important right now, because as we as we try to <laughs> restack our Benjamins and figure out where we're at, making sure that you're abreast of the changes as they happen and you're ready for change is an important thing. But you mentioned history first. Before we talk about the podcast, I want to talk about you and a few other projects. Because like me, I would say most people that are listening to this have heard your voice before. Uh, they know your work. But I've never heard this story Finance and Adam Davidson, like when did you figure out that finance was for you? I'm wondering if you came from this family where your family talked about money a lot, you were passionate as a kid, or maybe something happened in college. Tell me the Adam Davidson money story. Yeah, it's roughly the opposite of what you just said. So yeah, and my, my book and podcast, The Passion Economy, are about how people can live their passions. But a point I find really important to say is, I don't happen to believe passions are like either you got one or you don't, or they're obvious and full, or you're just, you know, I think passion, what your unique passion is, 
it can be a journey that takes a long time. And certainly mine did. Um, I grew up in Greenwich Village in the 70s, a very arty world of a lot of artists. And I grew up in a building that was all artists. It was um, it was actually the former Bell Labs. It had been Bell Labs before Bell Labs moved to New Jersey. So this amazing laboratory that really invented much of the modern world, um, you know, it was sort of like all of Silicon Valley was basically Bell Labs before one of the people who worked at Silicon Valley moved, you know, one of the people who worked at Bell Labs moved to Silicon Valley and created the modern Silicon Valley, um, William Shockley. But when I was born, actually the very year I was born, uh, Bell Labs was converted into artist housing, subsidized housing for artists. So I grew up in a building filled with painters and dancers and sculptors and musicians. And my dad's an actor. My mom has had a lot of roles in dance and theater. This is 1970s. So, you know, the 1960s generation grows up, has kids, moves to Greenwich Village to all artist housing. And it was a pretty exciting and wild place to grow up. And it was a place where everything was talked about. It was drugs and sex and politics. and. But I can't imagine, Adam, not many traditional money talks in that household. The opposite. Can... Yeah, so, right. And that is like, there was one topic that was off limits. Like it was truly, there, it was like I grew up in a, you know, a religious cult. It was not a religious cult, but right. it was, there was a shared worldview. And the shared worldview was that there are people who pursue passion and creativity and expression. And then there are people who pursue money and we were the good people and the money people were the bad people and people who have money jobs. They are people who don't have as much of a soul. They're cowardly. They're, they'd be artists if only they had the guts or the vision and money wasn't of interest, stock market, bond market, not interesting in the least. Like, I didn't know people with jobs. I mean, I knew people who made money, but they made not that much money. I mean, the building was not a rich, it was rich culturally. It was definitely very few people had any money, but they didn't like go to an office. I had this memory of driving with my dad in around Wall Street at some point when I, I don't know, seven, eight, something like that. And there were all these people, and Wall Street wasn't that far from us. I mean, the village is just a couple neighborhoods north of Wall Street, but we just never went down there. And there were all these people in suits. And I was trying to figure out if there was a funeral going on because I'd never seen so many people in suits except at funerals. And my dad explained, no, no, they just wear a suit every day. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it was huh? such a weird idea. Yeah. We called our teachers by their first names. We And I was a nerdier kid, maybe. I wasn't, you know, maybe I, I think I was creative, but I wasn't I wasn't interested in pursuing the arts as a career, much to my parents' disappointment for a while. And right into my 20s, when I started in journalism, I would always be interested in economics and money. Like, I just wanted to understand it. I didn't get it. But I couldn't find an entryway. Like, I would every now and then read a book or try and read, you know, the business pages of the Times, which when I was a kid, my, you know, that was the section that was just thrown out immediately. Right. <laughs> um, or I'd try and read the journal or... But I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't get it. And I didn't think, you know, if you told me at any point in my 20s, you know, you're going to eventually be a finance journalist, I would have been like, no, nah, I think you got the wrong guy. <laughs> that does not sound like me. But then I got a job because I was broke because I was really bad with money and I needed a job. And I got a job at Marketplace, the public radio business show. And I started to sort of have to learn fairly quickly. And I was like, wait, this is pretty interesting stuff. And then actually it was when I went to Iraq in 2003 for Marketplace. And I really saw for the first time very vividly how economics was such a potent way to understand issues far beyond just the stock market, like how societies work. Iraq was going through a transition. I mean, the idea at the time was it was going through a transition from corrupt socialism to capitalism. But really understanding Iraq through the lens of how opportunity is shared, how, how goods and services are shared, allowed me to kind of see economics as something that, that was much more relevant than I had ever imagined. And when I came back to America, I started covering economics in the US. And at first I found it boring again, because you know nothing like a war to interest a reporter. It was very dynamic and exciting. But over time, I, I started to pay attention and realized, oh, okay. 
you know, the, all the things I'm interested in, how does society function? How do, how does power work? What is right and wrong? What is, um, there's a practicality to looking at it through a business lens that's very interesting. And it started to feel like, oh, I'm getting to understand the rule book for the society I live in and realizing, oh yeah, my parents and the people I grew up with, they, it's not like I want everyone to be fascinated by money or to become a stockbroker, but it's like you live in a capitalist society. It has rules. It has systems. It's not a bad thing to understand, but I do think that there is a problem in how the media presents it to people. It's often a little bloodless, a little less dynamic and exciting. So, so that eventually became my passion, you know, but obviously a circuitous route. <laughs> it certainly was. And I like the, the viewpoint, Adam, of being able to, um, look at Iraq and then bring that back here and almost see what's going on here through a whole new set of eyes because of your experience there. Much like that, you know, this is uh, the third economic downturn we've had this century. We had, I mean, we've had maybe even more than that, but 2000 to 2002 was of course the biggie. We had uh, 2007, 2008. And I know during that one, you won the George Polk award for your This American Life episode about the chain of events that happened there. And then there's this one. How is this one the same to you through that lens of yours? How is it the same and how is it different than those last two downturns? I mean, I think there's sort of an overall thing happening that is both in part causal of these downturns and also exacerbated by the downturns, which is this dramatic shift from labor to capital. You know, in the grandest scheme, like the looking from the 50,000 foot view, the share of our economy that goes to capital, meaning people who own stock rather than people who earn wages, it's something like quintupled for capital. It's gone up. It's been a wildly disproportionate growth area. You know, we can argue whether that's good or bad, but it is true. It is a thing that has happened. And that has happened for a whole bunch of reasons we can get into, but technological change, globalization, uh, government policy. But as a result, what you see is a wildly disproportionate share of the growth of the economy going to a very small number of people. So you know, fewer than half of Americans own stock of any kind, but the vast majority of stock wealth, not surprisingly, is in the hands of the very richest. So, you know, so when you hear capital, yes, we all have our pension funds. Not all of us, but most likely if people are listening to a podcast, they're in the demographic that has pension, not pension funds, but has a 401k or stock fund or something. But capital really means the very wealthiest families because they, not surprisingly, own a wildly disproportionate share of stock. And this is such a great change that you really do see, you know, rather famously, the stagnancy. You really do see that people below, say, 20% of the income or wealth level, which, you know, let's say people who make less than 70, 80 grand a year on average, something like that, you know, as a group are just not making much money. And that means some of them are making a little bit more, some of them are making a lot less. And that is a fundamental change in our society. It's a really big change. And one of the ways that change manifests is, is how we borrow money, how we spend money. And that has created real confusion in what economists call the, the business cycle, like the, the kind of grow, boom bust cycles. There are many other things happening around the world that are also impacting this. But basically, we thought we had a pretty clear understanding of how to manage an economy right up until the 2007, 8, 9 financial crisis. And since then, we learned that we don't <laughs> at all, and that we hadn't, that we had messed up the 2001 recession, and that we had really just kind of swept a lot of fundamental problems under the rug and ignored them and just exacerbated the next crisis. So what they all share is this profound, we are unmoored. We had a kind of Keynesian approach for most of the post-war period. Then we had this more Chicago school monetarist approach. And now we don't know what we got. We're very confused. <laughs> and that, and then we also see that, and this is definitely something that came up a lot in the Middle East, that when a significant number of people don't see benefit in participating in an economy because they see that their effort doesn't benefit them, 
it fundamentally changes the politics of a nation in ways that are deeply scary. So um, it's bad for economies, but it's also bad for democracy when the benefits of an economy are not, you know, at least reasonably shared. I'm not saying, you know, you need, I, you know, I don't, sure. I don't believe in like some socialist economy where everyone gets exactly the same, but we're clearly out of whack. Boy, and we get more change and get more change every, every day. I just saw a meme that showed the calendar changing to June and the meme said something like, oh, what the hell now? Like what's the, yeah. what, what's, what, what's, yeah. the, what's the next thing to change? Which means, uh, Adam, to transition to your current project, The Passion Economy. I know you had a book that came out at the beginning of this year called The Passion Economy. Uh, well, you know what? Before we even get into it, let's listen to a little trailer of the show. The economy is terrifying. Kids are earning less than their parents. Manufacturing jobs have already disappeared, and your job is almost surely going to be outsourced or automated. I'm guessing, at least some of the time, you feel like the economy is changing way too fast, and you are getting left behind. And here's the thing. You're not wrong. The economy is not just changing. It has fundamentally changed. And you, you have to change as well. I'm Adam Davidson, host of the new podcast, The Passion Economy, which is a podcast about good news. I'm here to tell you that you are not screwed. In fact, I think for a lot of us, especially people who have special talents, the world has never been more exciting. Meet the people who have figured out how to thrive in an economy that seems stacked against us. It was like born out of desperation because I had no choice. They're not going to be billionaires. The goal was never to create this massive, massive market. They're going to be like you. We're not going to be a Fortune 500 company. That's okay. Regular people who want to be successful, make money, have a good, rich life, and love what they do. The last part, loving what they do, that is key. Actually, that's the key. Timing and opportunity align for me to really live my passion the way that I want to live my passion. On this podcast, we are going to figure out the new rules, the new ways to succeed in our new and often terrifying economy. If there's not a space for you, make a space. If there's not a seat at the table, make a new table. So tell us a little bit about it. What made uh, Adam Davidson turn his lens on this topic? So as we just discussed, I mean, I spent much of the last 20 years covering the downside of this dramatic change we're going through, covering rising economic inequality, obviously, covering the war in Iraq, covering an economic system collapsing. And I stand by all of that. I mean, it, there's real pain, there's real fear and understandable fear, lots of different fears, you know, lots of different ways to be afraid. I also began to notice that there's a flip side, that any dramatic shift has winners and losers. And the winners in this case are not just the super rich that this new economic system offers a kind of opportunity that's a new opportunity to human beings. And I think a really good opportunity, an exciting opportunity to do something, frankly, people have wanted to do forever and have not been able to do it. It's the opportunity to build a financial life that ties directly to your internal life, to your emotional life, to build a, a career or a business around the things that you are most passionate about and connecting to those people out there who are most, who most share your passions. Like, and, fe like uh, feeling some congruency. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this can, I mean, it can manifest in sort of touchy feely stuff like, you know, I'm making crafts or whatever, but it also can be very pragmatic. It can be, you know, an accountant who has come up with a way of engaging clients that is more, humane because of the way the accountant wants to have a connection with human beings. And he's able to do all the, what he himself would say, boring old accounting stuff, but he's also able to add, you know, far more of an in-depth human touch. It can be, you know, manufacturing, people understanding ways of creating products that serve a business function that they're particularly fascinated by, you know, aircraft engine parts or 
bottles of wine or, or whatever it might be. It doesn't mean self-indulgent. It doesn't mean non-economical. You know, many of the people I talk to are very, very well off, um, although my interest is not in figuring out how to maximize your income at the cost. It's how to understand that this economy allows you to not make trade-offs between quality of life and and your business. Well, and um, let's, and, and, and let's, if you don't mind, let's get a little specific because in your first episode, you go back to your Iraq, Iraq time. And my understanding is you hook back up with a gentleman who served as your translator, right? So you make this really real from that Iraq point of view immediately. Yeah, this is Amjad Rajab, uh, who's has a taxi and limousine company in the Washington, D.C. area, if you're looking for luxury, <laughs> wonderful. I, I wish I remembered the name of his company off <laughs> of the top course. of my head, but uh, but yeah, uh, please tweet at me at Adam Davidson and I will uh, connect you with Amjit. So I found it so interesting to look at the change we're going through through the lens of Iraq, because Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, you had one of the most centrally controlled economies um, in history. I mean, he explicitly modeled himself after Stalin. And almost everyone who had a job in Iraq had a job with the government. And if you didn't have a job with the government, you're working for some company whose actions were controlled by the government. And this was horrible in so many, many ways, including making the country extremely poor and the unbelievable corruption and, and the obviously the human rights abuses. This was terrible. And I in no way want to say anything other than it was terrible. But what was a surprise to me is how many Iraqis, it's not that they loved it or they loved Saddam. I mean, some did, obviously. But you get used to something and change is terrifying, even if what you're used to is a country where the average person might make $30 a month and has no upward mobility and no opportunity. And the other thing that was striking is you had a country where literally in a day, it went from one economic system to another. So there was that Thursday when Saddam fell. I was in the south of Iraq on that day, and then I went to Baghdad that Sunday. And by Monday, there were markets open in a free market. Turned out later, <laughs> the free market was destroyed. But for a little bit, we went from essentially the most controlled economy to a completely uncontrolled economy and a completely open economy. And a lot of Iraqis were really terrified. Iraqis who hated Saddam, who dreamed of his ouster for years because they didn't know the rules. How does this new thing work? What do we do? How do I get ahead? But some people figured it out. Some people were like, I think I get how to do this. I think I get how to succeed in this economy. And Amjad had a feel for that. He was a journalist. He worked for um, the English language cable news channel. And, the, and he also worked for this newspaper, Babel newspaper, owned by Saddam's son, Uday. These obviously were not free market enterprises. These were propaganda arms. But he right away was like, okay, I got to be near these Americans. I got to learn how they do stuff. And so I speak English well. I could be a translator. And he was an amazing translator. And he and I kind of had this running discussion as we traveled through Iraq for a year about how the rules were changed and who was figuring it out and who wasn't figuring it out and, and what did it mean. It took him a real adjustment once he, he eventually, I left obviously, and then eventually he came to America as a refugee. There's a funny moment. He landed in Washington, D.C. or in Virginia, and he got some rental apartment somehow. And I wasn't able to see him. That I saw him right away after. But he called me up in a panic. And he said, in America, you must pay money for the right to buy in a shop? And I was like, what? And he's like, I'm in a store. And they're telling me I have to pay money just to have permission to shop in this store. What is going on? I was like, no, I'm just, I, that sounds like a scam. I don't know what you're talking about. And then it took a long time to figure out that the apartment he got was right above a Costco and he was going into a Costco. And, <laughs> and he just did, he was like, I did not think that in America you, anyway, it was pretty Pay funny. to shop. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, you thought privacy was bad before. They check your receipt on the way out too, Adam. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was like, no, no, that's just the one shop. Because <laughs> I, I gave him a big thing about, no, Amjad, you don't understand anything. That's not how it works. And then I was like, okay, yes, it does work in that one store. And there's one other, but that's it. Well, maybe BJ's. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, maybe three, but I, but I swear yeah. that's, well, that, that, right. Yeah. Uh, the podcast is The Passion Economy. That first episode I listened to is a ton of fun. And I'm assuming, Adam, it's available wherever finer podcasts are distributed. Yes, widely Apple, Spotify. I use Overcast a lot. Yeah, like that. So yeah, wherever wherever you get your podcasts. And the website, by the way, is passioneconomy.com as well. And don't worry, everybody, we have you covered. If you're walking the dog, as Adam and I are talking, uh, we'll have the links at the show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Adam, thanks a ton for telling us a little bit of your story, and congratulations on the new show. Thanks so much. I do want to quickly mention, Yes, it's mostly not me talking about myself or Iraq. It's mostly just interviewing <laughs> right. really inspiring entrepreneurs and business people and others who have figured out the rules. So the goal here is this should be as easy and fun to listen to, but that each episode has real passionate kernels of lessons that you can apply in your life. Hey there, stackers. I'm your trivia pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And this whole appearance by Adam Davidson, frankly, has me a little confused. NASA, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos are all pushing to settle Mars, so why not settle planet money? Joe didn't even ask Adam one question about where planet money is. And if we found it, our problems would be solved, people. That is just a major oversight on your part, Joe. Come on, it's interviewing 101. All right, before I totally lose it, we better get to today's trivia. We all know that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first touched down on the moon in 1969, but what year was the last NASA lunar landing? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can moonwalk across the room. Maybe we'll talk later, OG, about my trip to Northern California while we had the off week. But uh, one thing that made it super easy were my Raycon earbuds. You know, whether you're working from home, working on your fitness, or riding on a plane that is uh, filled to the brim with uh, people, and every time anybody coughed or sneezed, uh, the whole plane, I felt like, seized. <laughs> but whether you're working from home, working on your fitness, you want to know what you're listening to, and you want that to be what you're listening to, not what uh, the person sitting uh, two seats over is listening to, and everybody needs a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before you go dropping hundreds of dollars, two, three, four, five, six Benjamins on a pair, you need to check out the wireless earbuds from Raycon. Now you already know the Raycon earbuds started about half, half the price of any other premium wireless earbud on the market. And that they also sound just as amazing as other top audio brands. You know, their newest model, the ones I have sitting right here, the Everyday E25 earbuds. They're the best ones yet with six hours of playtime. My flight was three hours long and I still had time for the car ride and forgot to charge them that night, which was on me. But then even the next day, I still had a charge. Seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Raycon's wireless earbuds are so comfortable, perfect for conference calls or binging podcasts. What I like best about it is the fact that it was super simple to store them. I just had this little tiny case, went right in my bag, made it super easy. Unlike some of the other wireless options, Raycon earbuds are both stylish and discreet. No dangling wires or stems to distract anybody during video calls. Of course, you've already heard me talk about how the company was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Cardi B. You can pick up a pair to see why everybody's so obsessed with Raycons. You'll see why I'm talking about them right now with you. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. You'll get 15% off your order because you're a stacker at buyraycon.com slash SB. That's buyraycon.com slash SB for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash SB. Hey, trivia fans, it's your spacey pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I've been looking at maps of the constellations, and while I'm annoyed with NASA, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos for not prioritizing settling planet money over Mars, the real problem here is Joe. I mean, he had one of the co-creators of planet money on the show. On the show. 
And how many questions did we get about the whereabouts of this so-called cash planet? Zero. Nada. Like none. Finding that planet could have solved everything. Federal debt, gone. Student loan debt, gone. A thing of the past. Need some new rims on the El Camino? Yeah, this guy does. Of course, we can all get new rims and valve stems once we reap the benefits of planet money. When I'm president, there's going to be no more of this Mars business. We're going in for big old planet money. I mean, it's out there somewhere. I mean, finding planet money is going to be like the eighth thing I do when I take office. I mean, the, the ninth thing, the ninth thing I do, with hashtag Doug 2020. Now that you know the important cornerstone of my campaign for president, let's get back to today's trivia. We all know that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first touched down on the moon in 1969. But when was the last NASA lunar landing? There were six lunar landings in a row during NASA missions across a 41-month period starting July 20th, 1969 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11. The last one? Well, that was December 14th, 1972 with Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt on Apollo 17. We need to get back to the space game, NASA. But now, let's set our sights on the real planet, Planet Money. I'm off to catch that Davidson guy before he signs off the shortwave. Somebody's got to ask the big questions around here. I'll show you how it's done, Joe. What do they say about darts and hand grenades? Mm -hmm. You were close. You were within a year of getting that right. Nice trivia. I can't wait for us to get back there, to get back to the moon. You excited about that too? I was listening to a podcast the other day. In fact, I told you about it. I don't remember which show it was, but the guy they were interviewing, his name is Naval Ramakant. And uh, he said that we're missing the opportunity on the moon to like try all of this engineering and energy type harnessing, whether it's nuclear or fusion or solar or whatever. Like we should be testing all that crap on the moon where it has virtually no impact to us on the earth. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that didn't like, work. You should, you should build a nuclear power plant on the moon and if it blows up half the moon, it does what it does. Right. There you go. You know? Yeah. You know, and try it out there and then harness that energy and take it back to the air. So that's I, a cool it, idea. I'm just so excited about that science. And I remember when we had uh, Rosalie Lopez on, remember that episode? And she was talking about how now she does most of her work, not on, volcanoes here, but she's working on Titan and they're learning a lot about what goes on under the earth by studying what's happening much more prevalently on the moon Titan. So interesting. In fact, uh, I was just at Lassen Volcanic National Park, a national park, by the way, I didn't know existed before two years ago. It's been around since Did you get your stamp? Did you get your stamp in your passport book? Cheryl did. You know what? You know what I've started doing on my away luggage now. Uh, my daughter started this trend. When I go to national parks, I stick a sticker on my luggage, and it's super easy to tell which one's mine now because it's got stickers all over it. So I also got a Redwoods sticker. I got a Highway One sticker, and I of course got the sticker of the tree that's so big that the car can go through it. Yep. You had to have that. I was going to get the one from the mystery spot, but I still couldn't find it. So, I've How many cases of wine did you get? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I bought one bottle of wine. Most wineries were closed and we sat outside by ourselves. Picked your own grapes, made your own wine? Made our own wine. We said, hey, can we help ourselves? They're like, sure, man. So, yeah, it was, it was good stuff. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first uh, hanging out at the compound, obviously, <laughs> the family compound. And trips and, to the moon. Uh, I'm about to go putt-putt golfing, so can we wrap oh, this up? Oh, oh, ho oh, beware the windmill. Well, that sounds like quality time with your loved ones, which is exactly what it says here in my script. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. They're Application simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. All policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. Today, we're throwing out the lifeline to Dave. Say hi, Dave. 
Hello, Joseph, an original gangster. I'm considering converting my traditional IRAs into Ross this year and wanted to get your thoughts. Last year, our income was around 285, but I was laid off in January. I'm starting a new career, so I don't expect to bring in much this year. But taking into account my wife's income, my severance plus unemployment, I expect us to be around 225 for 2020. I'm 44. My wife is 43. Two kids, a two-year-old and a three-year-old with 529 set up for both with around 10K in each. No debt. Currently have around 450,000 in retirement accounts, but only 15,000 of that is in a Roth 401k and the rest is pre-tax. 12,000 in a brokerage account. And since neither of us has an employee sponsored retirement plan, we're putting 2,000 a month into that account right now. Have a little less than 300,000 in cash, which is completely nuts, but we'll use 35 to 45% of that on a house down payment within the next year. Just moved across the country from a high cost of living area to a lower cost of living area and currently staying with my mom. So I too am broadcasting from mom's basement. I have a pension that'll pay around 4,000 a month at 65 and if I'll inherit a family farm that'll kick off a few thousand a month probably as well. So here's the question. I have 50 K combined between two traditional IRAs and the rest of my fund retirement funds are in old companies, 401k considering our income will be down. We have the cash to pay the taxes and our current retirement portfolio is so heavily weighted toward pre-tax seems like a good opportunity to convert. Please be my co-pilots and help me land our plane. Love the show. Size large. See ya. Nice flex, Dave. Size large. But he is. That's but, not what I was talking about. But he is somebody just like us in mom's basement. But he sounds yeah. like he's got the whole family there. Yeah. Which is great. You should try renaming it to the compound. <laughs> Don't call it the family see farm, the compound. See if it is a little more comfortable. It's good. Uh, what are you thinking, OG? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Where to start? Uh, I'll just answer his question. I don't know that I would do this. I don't know that I would be interested in paying 24 odd percent taxes. Probably, I guess I didn't look it up, but probably in the ballpark. On this conversion, hey, I think my income's going to go up. Why not just, um, I guess it's tomato, tomato now that I'm talking about it. I was going to say, why not just do a Roth 401k from here on out? You've got all this pre-tax money, whatever, half a million dollars or something he said. It's all pre-tax. Just let that sit and do its thing. And from now on, put money in the Roth 401k. You're 44. You got 20 years to do it. So so that could even it out too. You don't have to pay that big lump sum tax today. Although there is some benefit to doing that. Of course, then the money's all tax-free from here on out. So I think this is one of those either or probably works, You know, to be honest with you. Well, and I agree with the the premise of his question, which is, I think I have too much pre-tax. I really like his thinking there, OG, because as you know, giving himself some flexibility tomorrow is a good thing. And obviously, he's taken advantage of uh, tax rates today, so it takes the bird in the hand with the pre-tax. But if he's way overloaded in pre-tax, I think uh, finding a way to have more money in that Roth position is just generally a good idea. Yeah. I guess you can always do some speculation as to where you think tax rates are going based on elections and and uh, Congress and that sort of stuff. And if you suspect that maybe tax rates are going to be higher, maybe 24% is as good as you're going to get for the rest of your life. You know, and you look back and say that that's a pretty good number. But here's the other uh, thing I wonder about. Did he say that that he has a new job, that he knows what his income is? He said he's starting a new career and uh, expects his income to be a little bit less this year than last yeah. And so I think if he expects it to also be less next year, the other thing I like about this and about holding off, which usually, as you know, you and I aren't big fans of holding off. We're like, hey, if you're going to do it, do it now, right? Get it done. Don't wait for whatever thing to happen. But in this case, he knows he's got a house down payment in the next year. And even though it's not going to swallow all that cash, how many times have you seen somebody where the house purchase didn't go the way that you thought it was going to go? And you needed a little more of that cash that was sitting there than yeah. you thought that you'd need. So taking some of that money when he's got one of the major purchases of his whole life coming up also isn't attractive to me. Well, and to be clear, I think any Roth conversion, you should wait until the latter part of the year anyway, because, yeah, I mean, what if you hit a scratch off for 82 million? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that can happen. I mean... What if you win that big McDonald's, you know, yeah, million yeah. dollar the, prize? The, the million dollar prize, yeah. Rather unlikely, I understand. But you don't know. I mean, you don't know what your income is going to look like. 
what you say, Hey, I just started this new career. I don't know how it's going to go. And then you land a big client and you make twice as much money as you thought. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often either, but on occasion it does. You know what I mean? So either way, I'd be waiting until probably the first half of December to start working on this when you've got a real clear understanding of what your income is going to look like for the year. And if you can shuck and jive a little bit and move some things around to, you know, defer some income, you know, maybe, maybe you do get that big client in November, but you can negotiate it so they don't have to pay you till January. So you don't get that big check in December. You know what I mean? Like you have some more flexibility yeah. if you're thinking about it a little bit like that way, but um, you want that income um, to be as low as possible the year that you make this move. Yeah. And it sounds like he thinks that this is the last year, you know, it sounds like he's saying, Hey, this is, the, this is the lowest it's going to get over my lifetime. So it's now or never type of thing. The other thing I would add to this is it doesn't have to be all at once. That tax bracket for married filing joint is pretty wide. It goes up to somewhere three hundred and twenty odd thousand dollars uh, of taxable income. So even if your income starts increasing quite a bit, you've still got a little bit of wiggle room in there, and you don't have to all do it all at the same time. It's not an all or nothing proposition. If you've got this five thousand or fifty thousand dollars you want to convert, you could also just say, "Hey, I'm going to convert ten thousand dollars a year for five years. I'm going to convert five thousand a year for ten years, or you know, whatever." however you want to do it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. So maybe it's the right time. Maybe it's not. I wish I could give you a better answer. There's probably some math involved and we could figure out whether or not it's a good answer, but, uh, but I do I like think, you're thinking. yeah, I do think directionally though, diversifying this, uh, tax out is a good idea. Thanks for the question, Dave. You got a question for us. Be like Dave. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That sounds like a TM after it, doesn't it? Be like Dave TM. Mm-hmm. To be like Dave, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. All right, man, that's going to do it for today. Uh, we're going to let Doug thank everybody, and there's a ton of people to thank. Before we get out of here, just a couple of quick things. Number one is mom's bragging again, OG. It's about time. She's got a review on the refrigerator. Five stars from Diesel 3333. Love the show and commentary. Keep everyone involved and entertained. That is our goal, Diesel. And mom is very proud that you noticed. Thanks. Vin Diesel? <laughs> probably, probably Vin hanging out with us. If you can leave us a review and share with people what they're getting into when they listen to Stacky Benjamins, we appreciate it. And definitely mom does. When the Bridge Club starts coming over again, hopefully here in the near future. Last point, if you're somebody who needs better help, than just a couple of guys sitting on microphones. OG and his team are taking clients. So if you need help in your corner, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG, and that will link you to their calendar. And you can meet with OG's team to find out how they can make your financial planning go better. All right, Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Thinking about investing in a company that's gone bankrupt? Yeah, that's just gambling. And if you don't know who's going to lose during a gamble, it's you. Second, take a lesson from Adam Davidson. You don't have to hate your job to pay the bills. By focusing on your passion economy, you'll be a fountain of ideas on how you can make money by taking advantage of doing what you love. But the big takeaway? Wait, Planet Money's just a podcast? It's just a podcast! Oh my God, nobody's actually discovered planet money. That means I can be first. I'm going to do it. Let's do it. Special thanks to Adam Davidson for coming down to the basement. You can find Adam at adamdavidson.com. Also, we will link to his new podcast, The Passion Economy, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show, peeps. This is the part of the show that does not exist. Is it raining? Here at your house? Yeah. No, that's the fan on my computer. Oh, okay. Is that pretty loud? Well, it's hard to tell because like my fans going like crazy too. So yeah, when we say that our fans are going crazy, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different thing. Because <sighs> it's so hot in her. Cheryl asks me, she's like, how'd the show go? I'm like, our fans were going crazy. She's like, oh, wow, she must be going well. We got her fooled. But uh, during the break, OG, we didn't get to talk about this on Monday. I went to uh, Northern California. By the way, for those people that were worried about uh, traveling now, I can speak roughly about that. Plane, American Airlines, packed full of people, just sardines in the planes going and coming. Uh, But beyond that, once we got to Northern California, we had... uh, Even on trails, people would turn away from you. We had at the places that we'd stayed, it was clear that our rooms had not been touched in a while. In fact, we stayed at this beautiful place right along the Pacific Ocean, and there were three groups of people sitting there. They have one group of us down on one end, one in the middle, and one way on the other end of the the little resort. But I'd never been to this place, Lawson Volcanic National Park. It's been around since 1918, OG. I'd argue it's been around for a lot longer than that, but... Good point. <laughs> it's the dawn of time, but uh, but this is a bit since its uh, inception as a national park is what you mean. Yes. And so the park was formed, it's my understanding, after the volcano erupted. But before it erupted, there was a heck of a story where there was smoke coming from the top and there was some rumbling. And so three dudes decided they needed to go to the top to find out what was going on. Because I don't know about you. What the heck is happening? Yes. I don't know about you, but if there's noises in the basement and my hockey ski mask is gone, I immediately head to the basement. Exactly. Chainsaw. You hear a chainsaw (laughs) running. (laughs) I got to go down there and check it out. It's the very first thing that I need to do. But they go to the top and they get nearly to the top. And it begins really rumbling. There's a big rumble. And uh, they're within, I believe, a quarter mile of the top. And so then they start running, which is good because after they got down, the thing blew, the top blew. But what was even more amazing was that after the first explosion, a group went down to look at what happened. And luckily, they only stayed there during the day and then left the area at night because Within a couple hours of them leaving, the volcano blew again. It was incredible. There were these huge rocks that were over a couple miles from the top that had been carried down from the top of the mountain. Also, my first time summiting a mountain, I'll have you know. Okay. I need a point of clarification. Can you comment on the uh, elevation of said, air quotes, mountain Ten th- that required summiting? 10,600 uh, feet. Roughly, I think it's ten thousand five seventy two. I'm not sure that that qualifies as summoning, but I'll easy. I'll, I'll, I'll let me ask the judges. It took two and a half hours to get up and down from the top. Oh, I'm not saying that moving your fat behind up ten thousand feet wasn't easy. It was hard. It and actually, hard. actually, a car got us to seventy five hundred. So we only went. Uh, <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Actually, I was like, "Damn, you walked ten thousand feet. That's pretty good." Actually, in two hours, it took me nine to go from five to ten. <laughs> I felt, I, know, of course. I still felt gassed, just completely gassed. Oh, yeah. When I got to the top, that thing was difficult. And it's also while being cold. It was snowy. There was, there was snow on the top of the mountain. Uh, we kept going through big packs of snow. Lost in Volcanic, if you've never I been I didn't there. do any of that stuff on my vacation. No? You just went out on a boat. I saw you and the family out on a boat on Houghton I Lake. Probably about five years ago, I bought uh, a couple pairs of jet ski or a couple pairs. That sounds really grotesque. A yes. pair of jet skis. I b- I, b- and, I uh, bought a flock of jet skis. At the what is it called when you have a multitude of jet skis at your <laughs> compound? I I bought a um, credit card max of jet skis. <laughs> Isn't that what they call a flock of jet skis? A credit card max. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was kind of cool to to do that but um but anyways, i bought i bought an american ex- amex points i bought an american express credit check of jet skis mm-hmm. so anyways i have two of them so 
I was like, oh, these can be great. And, you know, we've used them more this year than we have in any other year, I think. But uh, it kicks your ass, man. It is. I'm just old. Yeah, turning that wheel. Something. Turning that wheel, having to having to to pull your wrist like from here a quarter turn to get that uh no it's a button it's even oh even it's easier. A, oh you gotta press the button <laughs> talk about like the waves where it's like rah, 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 you know because you're trying not to fall off all right well that's like have you been that. to have you been to ridiculed here so i'm just gonna let it go have you been to a theme park lately though and ridden a roller coaster i feel the same way about that like it kicks your butt i'm like i don't remember no. this from when i was 20 don't remember that at all no i haven't been to a haven't been to any place cool in a long time other than the compound. <laughs> Which, Which now has gone to incredibly cool. Yes, it's very cool. Yeah. I agree. You but just keep we saying get to begin the trek trek south in a little while, so we'll see. That's exciting. Exciting drive. Maybe we'll stay in Blytheville, Arkansas again. That's a happening to you and I stayed at the same hotel in Blytheville, Arkansas. <laughs> I know. Isn't that's that funny? Very, that's funny. When you when you wrote to me on the way there, you're like, Yeah, so I I'm staying in Blytheville. And I wrote, yeah, I stayed there at a Holiday Inn. And you said, I'm at the Holiday Inn. I said, well, mine was the ones with the Perkins attached. And you're like, (laughs) I'm like. Mine's the one with the Perkins attached. I'm like, I slept on the right side of the. breakfast, baby. I slept on the right side of the bed in room 232. And you're like, oh, my. (laughs) Well, I just saw the thing that says Joe was here, like in the ceiling. Scratched it. Like in Shawshank Redemption. (laughs) Got to mark my territory. So was OG. Right. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll do this uh, in uh, in person next time. Good times. Hope so.